the global gathering for educators and institutions is here. Anthology Together is where inspiration, connection, networking, and ed tech insight and innovation intersect into the premier event destination for the global education community. Registration is open. Go to anthologytogether.com. Three higher ed authors, 100 plus college and university presidents, dozens of actionable insights for academic leaders. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio back again and again. Again and again, no, it will never stop. Thank you for asking. Uh, no, it will never stop. We're going to keep producing episodes until we die, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, the first 125 presidents interviewed on this podcast, now we're over 220, I think. But the first 125 or so, we took all their insights. We put them in a book called Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education that I co-wrote with Kate Colbert and my co-founder of the Edup Experience, Alvin Freitas. It's out now on Amazon. In fact, my co-host today gives lots of amazing quotes in that book. Uh, you can uh, talk uh, to, to others that have read it, thousands of copies sold, telling the future of what higher education may or may not look like. In fact, what we write in Chapter 7 might be dismantled in Chapter 8, and that's because we've talked to presidents in, across, in and around the world who are giving us different opinions on what higher education is going to look like. And we're bringing another president here to the microphone today to tell you exactly what higher education will look like in the future. No pressure to him before I bring him into the episode. I want to bring in my guest co-host. She's got a mug. She's got the co-host mug. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. She's Laura Epson. She's CEO at Elucian. What's up, Laura? Hey, Joe. Good to see you. I'm virtual today, not in my office with the mug, but you know I love the mug. So Yes, yeah, so you sent me a picture of the mug, and then you sent me a vest. And the Lucian vest, which yeah. I... And you're not wearing the vest. <laughs> well, it's 90 degrees here, so the vest is going to take a little bit of vacation for a month or two. In uh, St. Louis, it's like 100% humidity, so the vest is going to take I'm a break. I'm sorry. We have a beautiful day in Virginia. Do you? Wow. Uh, I see heads nodding all the way around about Virginia. We're going to bring in our guest today. Speaking of Virginia, um, that's a nice cut over. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest, your guest today, he is Jonathan Helger, and he is president at James Madison University. Jonathan, how are you? Great to be with you, Joe. Are you ready for this, Jonathan? I am, I am ready. Looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. Uh, we are also looking forward to the conversation with you, and we always like to level set with our audience. We always like to assume there's somebody listening that that doesn't know much about James Madison University. So where are you located? Who do you serve? And how do you do it? Great. Thanks, Joe. Well, again, it's great to be with all of you. And if you're not familiar with James Madison University, we were uh, actually founded as an all women's teachers college back in 1908 in Harrisonburg, Virginia, in the beautiful mountains of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, but we're not your great grandmother's uh, JMU. In fact, now we are a co-ed National Research University with 22,000 students. The Amazing. students are undergraduates, but uh, we have a lot of graduate students as well. Uh, and we have a wide array of, of programs in areas like the arts and humanities, social sciences, science and technology, engineering, education, business, and, and health disciplines as well. So uh, we are known for very strong faculty student relationships and a very well-rounded student experience. Uh, we, I'd like to say that we combine, Joe, the best of what you see at small liberal arts colleges like Swarthmore that I attended with the very best of large research universities like Rutgers or the University of Michigan where I worked. But we're not either one of those things. We really combine the best elements with those very close faculty student relationships, a lot of opportunities for undergraduates to be involved. And we have a, a vision that is uh, fairly new, uh, which came about after I arrived to be the national model of what we, what we call the engaged university, engaged with ideas and the world that includes engaged learning, community engagement, and civic engagement. We can talk more about some of those components if you'd like, but really we're trying to prepare students with the skill sets they need for success in the 21st century in their lives and in their careers, no matter what field they choose to go into. Nailed it. I wanna to talk to, about you first, and, and I know we're gonna talk about students, but let's talk about you. You've been at JMU for quite some time, is that correct? 
11 years now, which is a long time for a university president these days. You're, you're, you're like asking, you're answering my question for me. And that's, you know, what's the secret, uh, Jonathan? I got to ask you because, you know, uh, recently reports are saying that tenure for presidency has gone from, I don't know, it's like almost six years down to four. A number of presidents are moving on, some within two or three years. And you wonder how... What does that do to an institution when you have an in and out like that? Can you, you know, strategic planning, which t typically is over five years, three, five years or longer. How do you execute a strategic plan? What's the secret to your longevity at JMU? And, and, and what advice do you give to other presidents? Well, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have come to a university that has treated its presidents well. I'm only the sixth president uh, at JMU since 1908. So if you do the math, the presidents here have tended to come and stay for quite a while. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that this is a place that really cares about people. Um, and, and you see that not just with the president, but with a lot of faculty and staff. They come here, they think they might only be here for a couple of years, and all of a sudden they wake up and they discover they've been here for 10 or 20 years or more. It's a beautiful place. Uh, but it's a place really that values those personal relationships. And so I feel very fortunate to have come to a place with that kind of attitude. And, you know, I think that as I would give advice to others that are thinking about presidencies or other, other presidents, um, you know, making sure that you're in it for the long term, because higher ed, if you're going to accomplish anything of meaning, you do need to have those longer term strategic plans, as you mentioned, Joe. A lot of things are not going to get done overnight because everything we do is a team effort. We are always looking on the long term, the horizon to think about the future and you know what are the jobs going to be of the future? What's the world going to look like in 10 or 20 or 30 years? So if you're going to do that kind of long-term thinking and planning for a university, it really helps to have that kind of stability and longevity and leadership. So I just feel very fortunate to be in a place that values that approach. Let me ask one more follow-up before I talk to, pass it to Laura because her questions are far better than mine. But I want to ask one follow-up. When you're there for 11 years and you're going through it cycle after cycle, year after year, in any job, you can get complacent. You can, you know, there's the old coffee stain on the carpet that you walk by kind of thing and you just become used to it. How do you, st how do you keep your eyes fresh? Is it student feedback? Do you have staff that just pull you aside and tell you, you know what, this is what I think without all the pomp and circumstance of the position. How do you get that raw feedback to continue to work in the job so fresh? Right. Well, you know, the great thing about being at a college or a university is every single fall, we are inundated with literally thousands of new students, right, as well as lots and lots of new faculty and staff. So there is that constant turnover that is built into our very mission. And that's a good thing. It does keep you fresh because every year I'm meeting with and speaking with incoming freshmen, their families that have hopes and dreams for the future, and they change over time as, as we've seen. So I think that helps a lot to, to spend time with students and to hear about what, what are their hopes and dreams and aspirations for the future. And then you're just surrounded by so many smart, interesting people who all have expertise in a wide variety of disciplines that I might not have. And that really helps me to stay fresh, to model the kind of lifelong learning that we want our students to, to have as well. So as president, I know that I am continuing to learn and I need to model that for our students. And so I stay involved in national organizations and associations, and we're always talking about the future. And that that has really helped as well to keep me fresh. Love it. Laura, over to you. Listen, um, I think one of the things that stands out about JMU is certainly the vision and civic engagement and community engagement and diversity. And I'd love to for you to share more with the audience around um, how have you managed those priorities through some really challenging times from feeling disenfranchised in um, uh, with Black Black Lives Matter, with some of the civic issues we have around the country, getting through COVID. I mean, it's crazy when you look at your success. You've been able to have unprecedented fundraising, move to an R2 inst um, research institution, move your football to Division One. I. I mean, all of this short term, which is long term, and still have that amazing focus on civic engagement and diversity. And 
Um, curious, like, what's the secret sauce and how, how, how is that reshaping what you do? Well, thanks, Laura. You're absolutely right. You know, JMU is, is really known nationally for that focus on civic engagement, first of all. And we are named for the father of the U.S. Constitution, James Madison, right? So that means something. It's part of our DNA as an institution, as I like to say. So when we brought, uh, brought about this new vision about being the national model of the engaged university, engaged with ideas in the world, it's really meant to be the opposite of an isolated ivory tower. The idea is that, look, we need to be relevant uh, in the 21st century, and that means not just learning and sharing great thoughts in the classroom, but applying that knowledge outside the classroom to real world problems and challenges. So I mentioned engaged learning, you know, that we talk about is, is high impact practices like study abroad and working on team projects and capstones and debates in class. It's not just passive learning, it's active. So that's, that's point number one in terms of how we do our work at, at JMU. The second is community engagement, that we feel if we're going to be relevant, that we have to apply that knowledge that we're developing to challenges all around us. It might be in the local community, around the state, around the country, or even around the world. And so we've got students doing service learning, for example, that when they're studying abroad, not just looking at great artwork in Florence, but also teaching English, for example, in the schools there. Uh, or working with disadvantaged youth in, in, Ireland, in Ireland or in Rwanda. So we are literally all over the globe doing that kind of community engagement to attack real world problems with partner individuals and, and organizations. And then of course the civic piece is to talk about not just your rights, but your responsibilities in a pluralistic democracy. Uh, and I'm a big believer that higher education has to be a leader in demonstrating how you bring people together from diverse backgrounds and experiences and walks of life to live and learn and work together. Uh, if we can't do it in higher ed, I don't know where that's going to happen. And we have such a deeply polarized society now uh, that I think it's really important for us to demonstrate how it can work to bring diverse people together, because I think we're a richer and stronger institution and society when we can do that and we can when we can bring out the full potential of every person. So that's something we've, we've really worked on. And it's it's challenging, you know, right now in this in this highly polarized environment. But I think it's a really important aspect of what we do. Well, and it, it seems to be when I said, what's your secret sauce? I mean, it's showing up in number of applicants increase over 25%. Your ethnic diversity has jumped. Um, there's something really magical about this type of students that you're attracting and building more diverse population. And I think a role model for the country. Are you seeing that show up in the results of those students as they come into JMU and matriculate and do great things outside? We are, you know, one of the, the things that uh, I, I really love about JMU is when I talk to alumni and employers and what I hear constantly is they say, you know, we love JMU students. We want to hire JMU graduates because they are well-rounded. They roll up their sleeves. They're good team players. They, they don't feel that sense of entitlement that you hear sometimes because of a degree that's hanging on the wall. And that's because I think we really focus on certain skill sets, including teamwork and leadership and problem solving, that we tell students, look, you're not going to accomplish very much on your own, that you're always going to be working with other people. So you better understand how to get along with people, how to work with people, to have that emotional intelligence, as well as learning the subject matter content uh, that we certainly provide across all the academic disciplines. So I think that's part of what we're really known for is those well-rounded students that do well in life as well uh, as, as in their careers. And, you know, one other thing I'd say, Laura, you mentioned COVID a couple of times, and of course, that was a really difficult set of challenges for all of us at colleges and universities, especially brick and mortar institutions that are residential communities, right? That People live here and they're in close proximity in the residence halls and in the classrooms. But one of the things that I kept hearing from students is we now realize what we had been taking for granted, that how precious it is to actually be together in person, to have this kind of interaction in and outside the classroom. That's when the magic happens, right? Uh, the magic with faculty. It's, it's not just listening to a lecture, but it's those 
those chance encounters on the sidewalk, it's going to office hours, it's staying after class and engaging in a conversation about something that was said uh, you know, during the classroom period with a faculty member. So that really is the magic of Madison is being very intentional about building those relationships. And it's something that you see, we, we are known for uh, opening doors on campus. And we take that both literally and figuratively. Uh, it's a polite thing to do, but it's also a symbol of what we try to do as an institution. Wonderful. And, and John, I want to ask one more follow up That's a on fact. students. On students, it seems that those types of connections that you've made may help the students at Madison, um, as so many students struggle with mental health issues. The stress and anxiety is off the charts. Every institution I talk with, you know, how do you get ahead of that and be predictive and support students? What are you, with the culture that you have in this community and civic engagement, what else are you seeing happening with students that you're supporting some of those struggles that I think no institution escapes, but it may be that this makes, helps get through the tough times for students. Yeah, that's such an important uh, question and set of issues, Laura, in higher ed right now. And of course, in our society, it's not just higher education. Absolutely. It's more aware, you know, COVID uh, really supercharged what was already an epidemic in terms of mental health problems in, in higher education. So we had a, a crisis of physical health, but also a crisis of, of mental health. Uh, and, you know, we are certainly uh, not immune from that. Uh, we have greatly increased our, our counseling services and support services for mental health. Uh, all of our faculty and staff do training to try to become more aware of mental health issues and, and challenges. And we now have 24 seven telehealth available for our students because we realize that, look, the crisis doesn't necessarily occur between nine and five Monday through Friday, right? Things come That's probably up. when it doesn't occur. It, it, that's exactly right, Joe. So, you know, if Saturday night at 11 awesome. p.m., yeah, if you're having a crisis, you now have somebody that you can talk to. And so we've invested heavily in those, those types of resources. But I, I would also add, Laura, to your point, when you're in an environment like this where people care about each other and you're not just a number, that those relationships, I think, help support people through the difficult times, because we talk very openly about that. That's where it's not just about your rights, but your responsibilities to one another, to lift each other up, to ask how you know, each other is doing, to make sure that we're checking up on one another. And the one other thing I would note when we talk about the engagement, uh, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's community engagement or civic engagement, when students develop those skills, they also develop a sense of agency. And the more you're focusing on the problems of other people around you and the problems of the world, then you start to realize, wait a minute, you know, my problems are maybe not so bad in the scheme of things, and I have something to contribute. I can help other people with my education, my talents, and that, that's really invigorating for students, and it's, it's a really important part of the experience that we provide. I want to add, I want to go back uh, on one of the things that you said, and you said something like higher education, we were talking about civic engagement, you said higher education is probably in the best place to demonstrate how uh, to, to earn the skills that we need to work together as human beings. And you know, probably as well as the rest of us that higher ed is under attack. Higher ed is under attack by the public who, um, uh, as we, we talk, there's this conversation about ROI. Is ROI a mathematical calculation for a degree that you go in and you come out and all of a sudden there's math on the other side that, that validates your initial investment? Is it not all about that math? Is it some other return that we're looking for? And what's happening, and you know this too, Jonathan, it's, it's, there's this, um, uh, there's this uh, I don't know, advice, we'll call it from those in and around, some, sometimes out of higher ed that say, you know what, you don't need a degree. You don't need to go to college. That four-year degree just isn't worth as much or doesn't have as much value as it used to. But what happens if we have a bunch of people who don't experience the things that you're talking about, how to work together, critical thinking, where does that leave us? It's a really touchy subject right now. What, do you, what, what are your thoughts around it? Yeah, certainly, Joe, we're, we're hearing that all the time, right? The attacks on higher education are coming from, from government, from the media, from, from the general public. There's a lot of skepticism 
and mistrust related to institutions generally and, and certainly to higher education in particular. Uh, and look, we understand that we've got to prove that return on investment. You know, this is one of the most important investments that any family is going to make in their, in their children when they send them to a college or a university. So we understand that those are serious questions we've got to be able to answer. And, and we, we feel very comfortable at a place like JMU when we look at uh, the fact that we've been number one in Virginia for getting a job for the last several years. Amazing. Uh, yeah, very high uh, graduation and placement rates. Uh, so we've got a good story to tell very low student uh, loan default rates uh, when you compare to national averages, but it's really is about much more than that, I think, to your question, Joe. Uh, and that value is not just about learning subject matter content, because anybody that's got a cell phone in their pocket has the Encyclopedia Britannica times a thousand right there available all the time to them, right? So it's got to be something more. And that's where I think the, the work that we do together is so valuable. And that's, that's what happens not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom in student organizations, in the residence halls when students are talking about some important topic late at night. You know, that's where a, a lot of the magic is, is, is happening and, and where you have to be very intentional about creating that kind of learning environment for people and a safe space for people to bring their differences to the table and to to see that not everybody has the same background or upbringing. And yes, you can learn from each other. You can change your mind uh, when you when you work with other people and, and spend time with other people. So it really is sort of a return on experience, if you will. It's not just uh, you know, getting what you could get out of a textbook. It's really, it's that experience with other people that is so valuable. And, and I think society really needs that. Uh, in leadership. And, you know, the founding fathers actually understood that. They knew that you needed well-educated citizens to provide leadership from one generation to the next. Because after all, the Constitution starts with we the people in order to form a more perfect union. That meant that the work was unfinished. And they knew that each generation had to pick up that torch and continue that important work. So I think higher ed has a really critical role to play. But we have to keep proving it. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is that JMU is a national leader in assessment of student learning outcomes. So we don't just say it, we actually study yeah. what students are learning. We try to measure it. And then we take those measurements and try to improve what we're doing by working with our faculty. So that's a really important part of what we do. Their premier ed tech event is right around the corner. Epic. Anthology Together is the destination for visionaries, educators, and learners ready to unleash the power of education technology. EdUp will be on site for the thought-provoking keynotes, peer-driven discussions, and unparalleled networking opportunities. We guarantee you will leave inspired and connected. You don't want to miss it. Book your tickets to Nashville for AT23, July 17th to July 20th. Register today at anthologytogether.com. It's time to level up. The beginning of a new era in higher education begins with you. Order your copy of Commencement. The beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert, Dr. Joseph Lucille, with contributions by Elvin Freitas. It's higher education's must-read book of 2022. Discover how you can seize the moment to change higher education forever. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, now available on Amazon. For bulk orders, contact Kate, Joe, or Elvin. I'd love to, um, since I'm wearing the technology hat, I know you do every day as well, but talk about the power of technology to empower, but also to disrupt. And when you talk about assessment and what do students really know and what are they learning versus what can they retrieve, one of the big um, things that's here right now is artificial intelligence. And I think many nice. institutions are trying to figure out the rules of the road many institutions are trying to figure out how do we actually assess progress and learning and accomplishment with artificial intelligence. I had a call earlier with a uh, colleague of mine that came from a company I worked with on the West Coast uh, in uh, Redmond <laughs> that um, is developing an AI learning um, really to help amplify what institutions do, not to disrupt. So I'm, I'm really curious, how are you thinking about artificial intelligence in the here and now? And how will JMU play a leadership role in thinking about this as it relates to student success? 
By the way, before you answer, Jonathan, I want to let everybody know that I did put into ChatGPT, uh, act as Laura Ipsen, <laughs> a Lucent CEO, and ask really good questions on this podcast with Jonathan. It. And it's working Stop out really job. well. I'll have so, to tell Laura that it worked. That's <laughs> great. Well, I did try that. <laughs> like, but my my team is like, Laura, if you ever like operate the company as a chat GPT CEO, we're all leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, hopefully this is the real Laura that we're speaking to, although you never, never know <laughs> these days. Uh, although they just did my headshots with AI and it was really creepy. Like, <laughs> do not do that. Do not do that. Ah! <laughs> I don't know. It could have some advantages uh, for some of us. But uh, <laughs> I have to say, you know, this this is obviously something that keeps presidents up at night. But you have to look at it not just as a challenge, but as an opportunity. And you know, it, it, it helps to take a step back and think about sort of the history and evolution of technology and how it's impacted education. Many years ago, when I was working at the American Association of University Professors, I was reading their files, uh, and they were predicting the demise of colleges and universities because of this incredible new technology called television. And they said, look, people are just going to be able to sit in their living rooms and watch these great lectures and they won't have to go to a class in person. You can save all this money and time, right? Well, we all see how that turned out. Yes, TV became a, a huge part of our, our lives, but it didn't displace colleges and universities. And I don't think artificial intelligence will either. I think it's going to be another important tool, uh, just like the internet and, and other great tools that have been developed over recent decades. It is a tool that has to be managed, and you know part of that uh, is focusing on ethics and ethical reasoning, which, by the way, is a program that we focus on here at JMU. We have a program called Ethical Reasoning in Action to help people think about the types of tools that we have available and how they get used or misused. And social media is a prime example with young people, right, that uh, we have to talk constantly uh, about just because you might be able to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do or the best thing to do. You know, I think artificial intelligence is, is going to be helpful in all sorts of ways. I think it will help us to teach better, but we have to be able to support our faculty, not just our students, to think about how do you use this tool to augment your teaching? How do you use it to help student learning. And yes, you're probably going to have to give different types of tests and quizzes, right? It's not just going to be about memorizing things or even writing a simple essay that, that perhaps artificial intelligence could do better. But there are still is always going to be room for human judgment and ethics and the importance of communications, uh, not just in writing, but orally uh, and body language and actually being with other people that is going to be so important. And I don't think artificial intelligence is going to replace that. So to me in higher ed, we need to be thinking about how do we use this to do what we do better than ever to analyze data better than ever. We're, we're trying to do that now to identify where are students struggling uh, and then what can we do to address those, those challenges in, in higher education. So I think there's a lot we can do with this as a tool, but we've always got to remember that it is a tool and it, we can't let it control us we need to control it uh, and figure out how to use it to do what we do better. Well, absolutely, President Alger. And I hope that with your expertise on law and policy, that um, sitting here in the state of Virginia, that there's more that JMU and you can do to help others think through this, because I see across higher ed, the data says less than 12% are focused on what the rules should be, but the policy, the ethics, not just the regulations, but the ethics of this, how do we come together as a state when there's not a traditional system wide for universities and really have Virginia shape some of this? Um, because I, I, it's going to become very balkanized in terms of the rules of the road. And I think there's a great opportunity for leadership. And you have centers that do this, and from your civics and your ethics areas that um, uh, I'll look forward to seeing uh, more that that comes out from JMU. Uh, well, me, me too. And that's why it's great to be surrounded by a lot of colleagues who are smarter than you are. You know, I look forward to <laughs> them. And that's what this is another example of lifelong learning, right? Because nobody was talking about artificial intelligence when I graduated from college you know, many years ago. And so this is a great example of how we all need to demonstrate that ability to keep, keep learning and growing. 100%. 
We call that disruptive agreement. That's my one of my favorites. Uh, I want to <laughs> talk about that lifelong learning piece. You opened the door for me. I want to walk through it a little bit, Jonathan. And that's and I find this this is one of the most fascinating things about higher education for me. And I always think about hotels. This is where I come from. I previous life I traveled. For, I traveled 50% of the time for 14 years straight. So I hit like Marriott, Lifetime, Titanium, Vibranium, Platinum. Like I got all this ridiculous thing, right? And, uh, and I only stay at Marriott's. Why? Because I get points and I get the free breakfast and I get a water when I walk in and maybe even they, you know, shove me a bag of pretzels. Sometimes my name's up on a board depending on the Marriott. And then I think about universities and go, wow, I got my uh, degrees from three separate universities. Got my undergrad at one, my graduate degree at another, my doctoral degree at another. You go, where was my loyalty to my university? And you think about it from a product perspective, we don't have the same kind of loyalty to our educational product, and I'm saying broadly speaking, that we do to where we buy a pair of sneakers. I only, I like Pumas. I just, I like Pumas, right? It's just my product. It's my brand that I associate with. And higher ed doesn't do a really good job of engaging people over the lifetime because it's sometimes a one-off transaction. I got my four-year degree here and I'm gonna go somewhere and work for 10 years and maybe I go out of state so I end up picking a school that's closer to me for some reason, not where I got my undergraduate degree. Do you ever think about that at JMU, that customer student loyalty piece and how to facilitate that over years? Absolutely. And, and that is something, uh, Joe, that I think colleges and universities need to be thinking about more in the 21st century, because it's no longer just a four-year transactional relationship, certainly not for a place like, like JMU. And you know, we have here a very strong sense of belonging that our students feel, and that lasts well beyond the time when they're here taking classes and, and get their degree. Uh, but it's something that we've, we've had to talk about quite a bit as you build uh, your alumni network to recognize that they are Dukes for life, not just for the four years when they're here. And so you've got to think very intentionally about that alumni engagement. And by the way, it starts before they even walk in the door. Right. JMU, we're doing more and more to build the pipeline into this university from students in, in elementary school and middle school. There are a lot of summer camps taking place right now where you're going to see really young kids running around campus and that's very deliberate to get them used to being on a college campus to get used to being part of that college experience uh, and then with alumni making sure that they know you know there are still opportunities at and through jmu that are available to you for example your career resources your alumni network a lot of our alumni get their jobs and grow in their careers because of those alumni relationships. And so being much more intentional about providing those opportunities, certificate programs, you know, it might not be another degree, but you might be at a point in your career where you just need a little bit of additional training in cybersecurity or some other new issue. And to be able to come back to your alma mater and get that additional training can be really valuable. I'll mention just one other example, Joe, that I've watched in action. We have a group uh, in philanthropy called Women for Madison. And, you know, we were founded as an all-women's college. The majority of our alums are female. And yet we realized that there was not a lot being done nationally in higher ed in terms of women in leadership and women's leadership in philanthropy and giving back. So we created this organization, which is multi-generational, called Women for Madison. And I have never seen such an enthusiastic and excited group. Uh, when they come back to campus and they're networking and sharing across the different generations, it is so powerful. And they're realizing the value of that lifelong network and connection to the university. So in many ways, they're showing us how this can be done and how that can be incorporated across the entire university. Keeping your alums engaged and involved, helping us to think about the trends that they're seeing in the workplace and in society, there's value to all of us in that. It's unfortunate we don't have any uh, women who are passionate about philanthropy here on this uh, podcast. Uh, well, I, I mean, I've argued for that, but just on the philanthropy side and giving back, it's something that JMU does so much in the community and charitable organizations. And, you know, at Elusian, we focused our time and attention on our past scholarships. So during COVID, gave started with a million dollars to give 
um, small um, scholarships to students. And uh, this year we're focused on um, community colleges uh, um, and also the HBCUs to make sure that we're helping diverse underserved communities. And President Alger, you've been such a leader on those areas of diversity and inclusion. And as we celebrate Pride Month, I'm curious, you know, what are the messages that you have for others where JMU has been leading and sh showing the way? Uh, we had Asia Pacific Islanders Month last month. We had Pride Month. Diversity, equity, inclusion is just so important. And this is a place where I think higher education is the best of the best to lead the way. And JMU has been one of those leaders. Well, thank you, Laura. You know, it's so Im important to me when you think about diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. This really is the lifeblood of, of the institution. And I'm a big believer that the most important strategic asset we have in our society is our diverse human capital, but only if you allow people to develop to their full potential. Right. I mean, it's it's more valuable and more important than the technology or the buildings or anything else that we have. Uh, but the question is, how do you do that and how do you do it better? Uh, and you know, I think it starts from the premise that diversity and excellence are not two competing concepts, but they go hand in hand. We become a better, a richer, a stronger university as we become more diverse. And it's not just about race and ethnicity or gender or even sexual orientation, but it, you know, when you think about diversity and access, it's it's for people of all backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different walks of life, veterans, right? Uh, people from different ages and stages of life. So everybody in every family should be able to see themselves in that rich human diversity that is represented at the university. Part of the idea of the university, though, is that you do bring people together to realize that the whole is greater than the sum of a bunch of individual parts. Nailed it. And, and you know, I've got a lot to learn from you, Laura, right? And you hopefully have a lot to learn uh, from others in that in that kind of environment. So we all have something to contribute and we all have a lot to learn. Uh, so that's the starting premise. And then you've got to work on creating that welcoming and inclusive environment, which has implications for how you develop a pipeline into the, the college or the university, and, and what kind of atmosphere do you create once people are here? Uh, what's in the curriculum? Are you representing the rich diversity of the human race in, in your teaching? Um, let me just give you one example of something that we're doing uh, to try to provide more access. Um, we have a program called Valley Scholars that, that I started shortly after I arrived at, at JMU with the help, of course, of many partners. Uh, and it was modeled after a program we developed when I was at Rutgers. Uh, and the idea is that we identify students while they're still in middle school from seven different local public school districts who would all be first generation students in college, meaning their parents didn't go to college. Um, and it's a competitive program to get into. They're identified by teachers and guidance counselors as having academic potential, but that probably would not necessarily go to college without intervention. The deal is that we work with them for five years, eighth grade and all through high school. If they keep their grades up at a certain level to get admitted to JMU, there's a full tuition scholarship waiting for them. It completely transforms their lives, and frankly, the lives of their families, younger siblings, and friends, and communities as well. The very first cohort of Valley Scholars just graduated from college uh, this May, which was just thrilling for us to see. So uh, that's a great example, I think, of the kind of partnership that you can develop with K-12 schools. We had wonderful philanthropists and corporations that supported us in that effort. But that's the kind of work we as a society need to be doing to bring out that the potential of that rich diversity in our society. That's that's Congratulations. amazing. Congratulations. Congratulations. It must have felt pretty good to see them yeah. graduate. I mean, that has felt really, really good. Yeah, Send we some watched them my way. I'd love to hire some of them. Send them my way. I would love that, Laura. They they'd be terrific folks because they you know, they don't take education for granted. They realize what a precious gift it is and they want to contribute and give back. So they'd make great employees. Yep, I hire interns too, and you're not that far away. <laughs> the, the, the really important point that you made there that I think needs to be reset because we don't say it enough in higher ed is the 
rippling impact of that one degree to that one student in that underserved community and what that ripple effect does to their family members, to their friends, to the community itself, to turn it, to change it, to educate it, to, to different aspirations, uh, di different hopes and dreams. The power of education goes well beyond the person who's receiving the degree. It, it permeates uh, hopes and dreams. And, you know, we, we always talk about the noble work, or I, I think maybe sometimes we forget in higher ed that we do noble work of, of uh, teaching and, and educating and, and all of these things, particularly when um, the outside might say that, you know, uh, higher ed's too expensive. What are all you guys doing to, to these kids? And you're making them take on this debt and these adults can't afford this. But there are a ton of universities, I know, Jamie, trying to make uh, this uh, education more affordable um, for every student type, because we know as consumers ourselves that you have to have something that you can afford that has to be financially possible. We all know that. It's not like we're higher education people and we work in this industry that doesn't understand consumer concepts. We know that. And we know that universities are doing the work of, of broadening access and making affordability a, a central issue. Do you, is that work going on at JMU to prep the future but not saddle students with years and years and years of debt, right? Because there's the output isn't always just dollars and cents, not in that first year anyway. There's years and years and years of benefit for that degree. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right, Joe. I think you know, education is the best investment anybody can make, in my opinion. Uh, yes. Multiplier effect, right? So uh, if, first of all, we have to recognize it as that, as an investment for the long term. There are things that I learned in, in middle school, in high school, in college that, you know, you, you forget about for years and all of a sudden you realize how the pieces fit together and, and how you've benefited from things that you learned uh, a long time ago. And so, you know, I think you have to have that long-term view, first of all, in terms of the value of the investment in, in higher ed. Uh, it's something that for a state university like us, we hope that people understand and, in terms of state government, that this is a really important investment that the state can make. But we're also increasingly focusing on private philanthropy. Uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of folks involved in something called Duke's Pay It Forward, for example, where people, many of whom benefited from getting scholarships when they came to college, are encouraged to give back and pay it forward to future generations, knowing the value of that investment and understanding, Joe, your point about accessibility and affordability that we don't want higher education only to be for the rich or the well-off. We want everybody to have that kind of access and opportunity to develop to their full potential. And so it's something we pay a lot of attention to. We're considered one of the best values in American higher education consistently. Uh, so when you look at the, the tuition at a place like James Madison, we're a great value, but we know We've got to do more and more to provide financial access for students that can't afford it, who might be the first generation to go to college. And they are the future of our country. And so it behooves all of us to make that investment in our fellow citizens and to find ways to do that. And, and that's something we've got to do together. Laura, do you have any other questions uh, before I- I'm going to do like the quick hit thing, which is you've been at Madison 11 years toughest challenge that you ever came and proudest moment? Goodness. Well, I'd, I'd have to say uh, toughest challenges, you know, COVID certainly comes to mind for all of us as university presidents. I think, you know, those counted as dog years, right? Going through that because <laughs> there was no playbook, right? I mean, there's nothing in the president's handbook about how to deal with a global pandemic. Uh, and so we all struggled through that together and you know, learn from each other's mistakes and, and learn from successes as well. But I think it made us more resilient uh, as an institution and, and hopefully as a society. We're still going to be studying that. There are a lot of dissertations to be written in years to come about the impacts of, of COVID, not just physically, but psychologically uh, and, uh, and our society more, more generally. So that certainly would be you know, and I guess I should have expected that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think proudest you know, moment, proudest moment. And, and I'd say, you know, proudest moment. It, you know, I mentioned that Valley Scholars Program. Watching students like that walk across the stage, and you know, I I get to speak at every graduation ceremony, and and now that we're shaking hands again, shaking every single hand, 
Uh, and I have to say, when those Valley scholars walked across the stage, having watched them since middle school was just an incredible uh, experience for me to think about how their lives have changed. But what I think about when I see those students, Laura, what makes me so proud is not just them getting their education, but what impact they are going to make on the world. And so I sort of imagine that when I'm at graduation, I think about you know, these, these students, whether they're getting a degree in music or nursing or history or biology or whatever the case may be, to think about how are they gonna use that education to make a positive difference in the world. And that's really exciting for me to think about as I shake all those hands. Well, yeah. we're gonna close, by the way, before I, going back to your point about the degree, um, I got a BS in speech communications. Little did I know, because what are you <laughs> gonna do with that? Little did I know many, many years later, I'd be interviewing the CEO of Elucian. Well, I guess you're co-interviewing with me and the president of JMU. See, mom and dad, speech communications can pan out in the it end. It all worked out. It all worked, it all worked out. out. You it never worked know, out. right, Joe? <laughs> when, when, my, when my dad said you have a BS in BSing, he didn't know exactly what he meant, but it's true. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Well, we want to close the episode here um, and ask you, really, number one, soapbox about JMU for a minute. Anything that you wanted to say, didn't get a chance to say, anything coming up, anything on the horizon, anything, I'm giving you ideas, but really soapbox for a minute or two. Sure. And, then, and then tell us what you see for the future of higher education. Okay. Uh, well, certainly uh, I, I might combine these, these two, uh, Joe, in this way. One of the things that I see in terms of the future is that the big problems of the 21st century don't fit neatly into some disciplinary bucket. Uh, you think about climate change, you think about incredible economic inequality, you think about extreme political polarization and how that's challenging to societies. You think about the threats and opportunities of artificial intelligence. These don't fit neatly into just one field of academic study. So what does that mean for our future? Well, at, at JMU, we've been thinking about that question for a while now. Uh, and I think the answer is that you've got to look more and more at opportunities for inter and transdisciplinary education, uh, meaning that you're bringing faculty together and students together from different majors, from different academic backgrounds and disciplines to work on solving problems together and to develop those skill sets that will be required to take on those big challenges. So, for example, we have a program here called the X Labs, where faculty team teach that come from different colleges across the university, different academic backgrounds. The students come together from different majors and they work in teams on what we call unscripted problems that, that might come from business or from government where there's no answer in the back of the textbook. They're just told, here's a problem we're trying to solve. Students go at it for a semester. You've got a mentor who might be from industry. Uh, along the way, and they learn a lot from experimentation, from trying and failing at different things, but that teamwork, the collaboration, the problem solving that comes from people working from different backgrounds and different perspectives is so incredibly valuable. And I think that's something that we do really well here at James Madison University, but it has implications for the future and the structure of higher ed, the kinds of faculty that you hire the kind of support you provide for faculty, what gets recognized in hiring and tenure and promotion. So that I think is one of the big waves that is already hitting American higher education. And we're trying to be at the forefront of that at James Madison University. And the, the one other thing I would say is, you know, getting back to this idea of civic engagement and civic responsibility, that higher education is not just about workforce development. We, of course, want all the students to be gainfully employed, and, and we're doing a good job at that. But it is so important to me that our students also graduate with a sense that they are going to be citizens in a pluralistic, democratic society, and that they have not just rights. We're really good at talking about rights uh, in our society, but they also have responsibilities to and with each other to live in peace, to work together to solve problems. And that, to me, is such an important message about the role and the mission, especially of public higher education at a place like James Madison University. So we talk about that from orientation all the way through graduation and beyond. And I think it's a really important part of who we are 
as an institution. And I think it helps to make us distinctive and to fill a really important need in American society. Well, if you think you could say that better than he said it, you're wrong because you said that pretty darn well, uh, President uh, Alger, because I'll, I will tell you what, uh, you are right on. And I think we don't say that enough. We're too focused on the immediacy of a, a degree in, in earnings and not about what it does for society in the long term. What an honor to have you on the podcast today, sir. Laura, what do you think of this episode? Uh, I'm blown away. This, I think one of the best and, and just a lot of things I'm going to think about from this conversation. Thank you so much, President Alger. Great to be with you both. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me outro my amazing guest co-host. She's got a mug. She's amazing. She'll be back. This is not the last time you'll see her or hear from her. She is Laura Ipsen. She's CEO of Lucian, one of my favorite people on earth. Laura, thanks for being here. And my guest today, your guest today, here he is again. We're going to get his name right this time. I, maybe I messed it up at the beginning, but I always get it right at the end. He is the president of James Madison University. He's Jonathan Alger. Jonathan, thanks for being with us today. Um, what an honor to have you here. We hope you enjoyed yourself. While you got thanks, to Joe. It was a lot of fun. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed up. Now, what can you expect at AT23? That's Anthology Together 2023. Well, expect to look into the future, expand your network, and explore solutions with experts. You're going to hear from industry thought leaders. You're going to connect with countless opportunities and people representing different institutions across the globe. You might even get to test out some new tech and help drive future anthology technology. That's right, Anthology Together. Registration is open at anthologytogether.com. You know that the world of higher education is experiencing evolutions and revolutions. You want to be part of the progress. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education with insights from more than 100 college and university presidents will show you how. Get your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education now on Amazon right away. We think you're going to love it. It's amazing.